afternoon o'clock. Time to start. Leo brought it. Is Leo here? Yeah, Leo brought a new clock, but then he's not obeying it. There, there he is. Now we can start. <laughs> Going in a little bit different order. There's a section of the thermal space. It's either totally skipped or put off till tomorrow, depending on how this goes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about mini body localization, which is one of the Problem, problems in non-equilibrium dynamics. Very interesting and has challenged us for quite a while. Not here. And uh, we think we've made some progress in the past few years. I've been working for 20 years, but a bunch of stuff I learned rather recently. Uh, that I think some people well, and I'm trying to tell you about two aspects of the problem. Emphasize which we learn more about quite quite recently. Also, sort of try to summarize what's the current state of our understanding and where's the place where we could be the priority for learning more. Okay, so what is MPL? Anderson localization, many interacting freedom. Um, and it's a highly excited state that if they went thermal equilibrium, it would just want to go in. So we're not at zero temperature. So we've got, we've got localization, we've got interaction, and we're not at zero. So most of the work on Anderson localization or metal insulator transitions is either non-interacting particles there's an enormous there or you know, people are thinking of metal insulator transitions or superconductor later transitions but that's usually focused on pure quantity stuff whereas this is things that's happening in a very unexpected state not traditional quantitation but the dynamic quantitative transition uh, that you have to Not many people know it, but um, if you look at Anderson's original paper, it was many body localization. He was working, thinking about were spins in semiconductors. People were doing uh, resonance experiments on spins in semiconductors, and he was, and then the, the, the resonance experiments showed peculiar line widths. And he was thinking about thermalization. Also, he was asking, you know. Does this spin system with these spins interacting with each other, if we ignore the interaction with all the phonons and everything else, does this make a bath that's explaining the climate? It's about thermal But that's just the first few pages. And then he made some approximations and turned it into a single non-interacting part. Right. Interesting to go back. Just read the very beginning of that paper and see how connected it really was. It really amazed me. I've been working on MPL for a while and then went back and looked at it. Well, you sort of have to read between the lines, and, you know, and the language is very different. Right? It's the language talking about this stuff in the language. It's very different than the way we talk about it. Um, so, anyways, following Anderson, we'll do spin models. Spin models are to work with. They have MPL. They worry about MPL. Okay. Now, 
there's a trivial limit of NVL. Trivial limit. So let's say we have N. F. H not, which is sum over all the ends. And I'm going to use S. Put some numbers. I want them to be right. I have to use S rather than eigenvalues plus or minus a half. This is a simple Hamiltonian. Diagonalize it in your head. Doesn't obey E E H, right? The eigenstates of this are just any pattern of spins up or down. Lead field. So it could either be well, we, we want the H ends uh, non-degenerate. Yeah, so N labels the spin, and Z is the Z component of the spin. So uh, I want my HN non-degenerate, so it could be random. So, so what we're going to do most of the time is random. And traditionally, people, it, it should have been Gaussian, but people started doing it with a square distribution. That's, once you have one model that a lot of people work on, everybody else works on the same model. It doesn't mean it's a good model. Um, so, so we pick the, pick the field random uniformly between minus W and W, but it doesn't have to be random. You know, it could be, could be uh, quasi-periodic in a deterministic pattern. What's important is the fields are all different, uh, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be random. It could be you have Anderson localization. You know, people say, oh, Anderson localization, you got to have this order. This is not true. Quasi periodic potentials, which are perfectly non random, have answers. I mean, it's not about random, it's about levels that are not general. It's about detuning how different levels they're at different energies. If they're weakly coupled, they don't mix. They don't mix random. It's just energy difference. But I'll be mostly talking about the random. Here, I get are just uh, any pattern of spin down. Uh, and so, uh, so, 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 the eigenstates of this, there are two of them that are the which is the ground state. The ground state, if it's unique, always obeys ETA because zero temperature, if there's only one state, equilibrium. This state, state of minus state, and it, but all the other ones don't obey. Okay? Because if you're at a temperature that's not zero, the expectation value of any spin shouldn't be exactly plus a half or minus a half. It should be somewhere in between, you know, given by the blue amp function or whatever you say. And, but the eigenstates of this, they all look like zero temperature, and that they have the state fully up for full. So there's, so there's no ETA, no transport, it doesn't thermalize. All that happens is they spin for that's about the period. That's all that happens. Yes, it obeys on dragon we ETA. Right, but there are no off diagonal matrix elements. So all the off diagonal matrix elements satisfy ETH because there's none. Well, there's no violation. I can say it this way there are no violations of off diagonal ETH in the ground state. Because there's only one state and there are no off diagonals. So they can't violate. Right. There are two to the end eigenstates. 
so the typical gap is between eigenstates and two alignments and those gaps. The ambiguous phase, the typical phase is gap. Sorry, some next question. Yeah, well, people put those on. I'm not sure how important they are. They're important for doing some about thermalization. Um, where you, yeah, you, you, want, you don't want to be able to add up a number of HN to the same state. Yeah, that's, that's, in some sense, that's what I mean here. The spectrum of this is non degenerate. So if I say the spectrum of this is non degenerate, that means I, I don't have any such thing. Thank you. That's that statement true. That's what I meant here. Or I didn't say it. I can't change my mind, but I wrote it. Uh, it's trivial, but it is part of it, captures some of the properties of the. So now move away from the trivial Let's add. One J coupling, which is move away from zero, and one. And I'm leaving open boundary conditions. We usually do that. Um, Frank. Right. Yeah. So this isn't about the ground. This is not about the ground state. This, you know, we're 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 going to work in the middle of the spectrum of this, and you know, the gap is very small. And that's what that's part of what makes this a very hard problem. As of course, Frank knows, um, you know, it just makes it very hard to do certain kinds of numerics. Um, We're not interested in the ground. Figure it out. That's a homework assignment for you. <laughs> uh, okay. And if, if we take the random case here, this is what's called the standard model of FPL, yeah. in that it's more study than any other model. Like to pair their data out to data so and to all concentrate on the same model. There's lots of other models that are studied as well. Um, I'm going to, hmm? yeah, this is it's non random. This is just Heisenberg spin chain. Yeah. Um, today, I would not pick this model at all, right? Uh, I would pick a Floquet circuit. I would have no conservation laws. So we, you know, originally in Anderson localization, well, Anderson wasn't talking about transport. He was talking about relaxation of spin. So he he didn't have a hang up about transport. But most of the literature on Anderson localization, it's all about transport, right? And uh, and so when people first studied started studying uh, MBL, they wanted to have conserved quantities to be transported. And so, you know, this has got both two, it's got two conserved quantities, energy and total SZ, right? So this can be total SZ as does this. Um, but now we understand MBL, it's not about transport. It's about entanglement, uh, you know, thermalization. It affects transport, but the transport in some sense is a distraction. Um, 
And so I now prefer models that are uh, bouquet models with no no uh, sort of quantities. But I'm but this is it's familiar to many of you. It's a Hamiltonian. It's I think just for today there's there's no harm in focusing on this model rather than a floquet model where you, you know it's less familiar. They're not so different. The floquet models are nicer to work with when you're doing numerics uh, in many respects. Okay. Hmm? I'm going to talk about that. Yeah. 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 I'm going to talk about this model. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So, so one issue, you know, this thing has a non trivial density of states. So, as you're, you know, whereas, if I have a Floquet model and it's a large system, I know the density state, right? All the states are on the unit circle, they're uniform, and I know exactly how many did, right? So for example, what's the mean gap? You know, so, so that's a very nice, that's an important thing in thinking about MBL is what's the density of states? What are the gaps? And here you gotta, fig, you know, you gotta figure it out. Whereas a Floquet system, you know. And, you know, there's effects due to the transport and they're a distraction, right? And, but, you know, it's not, it's not a big deal. So, so and, you know, if it were a big deal, I wouldn't be talking about this model, right? But it's, a, it's you know, when you're actually working in the field, it's something to pay attention to. Okay. Now, okay, so what I'm going to do now is uh, let's, okay, so since it has conserved SD and we're often doing exact diagonalization, it's convenient to just fix total SD equals one. So fix some, sorry, not one, zero. We have an even number of spins, we can do this. So fix the total SD equals zero. And also let's, let's uh, work near E equals zero. So the maximum entropy of this, the infinite temperature is at zero energy. All these operators are traceless. So we're going to work near E equals zero. So we're at fix. This we fix strictly. This we fix approximately. Um, and then there's really just one. Since we're just doing, we're doing dynamics, and we're just going to remove. Uh, you know, there's an overall constant, but this Hamiltonian has basically got two terms, and the relative strength of these two terms is the ratio of J to W. So it's really just got a one. It's really just got one parameter. This model. If once we fix these two things and we start looking at behavior. So we have a phase diagram uh, in quotes that looks like this. Now, what do here? Yeah, so I'm actually going to. So there's another thing. Many of you, if you follow the MBL literature, people always draw the phase diagram with this the other way up, strength of the disorder. And then the MBL phase, the, the trivial limit of MBL is out at infinity. But what we've learned over the years is all the interesting stuff is happening near this limit. So let's not put it out at infinity. Let's put it at zero. So we're start. We're going to start with this model. We're going to add some interactions. When is it stable? And as we add the interactions, when does it thermal? And it has the parameter is still rather small. So it's nicer to just place this way. Um, what we know, try to try to tell you what I guess in some sense. Say there's nothing to do. Proven, but uh, yeah, of course, this limit is trivial. We can see that this. Um, the other limit is the high chain change, beta on the solvable. We can see that very well. Everything else in between, uh, nothing is rigid. So you could say we know nothing, but we've learned a lot from numerics, and we think we think we know a fair amount of it, right? And that's what I'm going to tell you. Uh, 
Okay, so there's the MDL phase, which is where it stays localized. Uh, so this remains, when I say the MDL phase, I mean it remains MDL in the limit n to infinity time to infinity. In order to make it a sharp question, is it MBL or does it thermalize? We need to take these limits, as I told you earlier. Um, okay, so that's the MBL phase. Phase, call it the phase. Um, and then we believe there's a, we believe there's a transition at some J sub C. And this is bounded by some number around here. So we have data that puts an upper bound on this transition. So it doesn't tell you the MBL phase is actually there, but it gives an upper limit as to where it is. And I'll tell you where that number comes from. And then over here, we have a crossover. And this drifts as we go to larger systems, this crossover drifts that way. And we might expect that in the L is gonna move over all the way to the transition. Uh, but again, we don't know that. Yeah, I bet it is. <laughs> Excuse me? Yes, yes. Well, I think the right way to say it is there are arguments that it is at non-zero value and there are arguments that it's at zero and the arguments that it's at non-zero seem more compelling, right? But I'll talk about it. Actually, mostly I won't talk about that. So part of the, part of the point of my talk is we've learned, right, so I've drawn this quantitatively accurately. So this is around 0.3 or so. I've drawn this quantitatively accurately. And so what we've learned really just in the past couple of years is, yeah, actually, let me back up and describe these two regimes here. Okay, so this is the thermal, thermal regime. So I'm calling these regimes because they're not separated by a phase transition. They're just separated by a crossover. So I'm calling them regimes. This whole thing here is the thermal phase, right? But the thermal phase contains sub-regimes. And the thermal regime, this is where we, the uh, C, EPA, the uh, volume law, entanglement, eigenstates, volume law entanglement of eigenstates um, in the system thermalized to a good approximation, right? And when I say accessible, I mean, if we're doing exact diagonalization, small enough so we can do exact diagonalization, or if we're doing dynamics, short enough time so we can do the dynamics accurately, right? As Frank said, you can't take the dynamics in a big system to very long times if it's getting volume law entangled. Um, so, so, so when I say, and so of course this is L dependent, L dependent, and that's why this moves. And then, so, so that's the thermal regime. Anything else about it? RMT, RMT, random matrix. So these are these are the properties over here. And it, yeah. Well, the, yeah, this crossover drifts with L, yes. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah. The thermalization time is doing something here, and you can, yeah, you can make criterion based on that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, basically, when you're in the this is the MDL regime, right? And here, it doesn't thermalize. So the thermalization time really only exists in thermal regime. It doesn't exist over here. Yeah, yeah, it's going up. But I, I'm emphasizing a different distinction. Okay, so the MBL regime means, you know, for, again, accessible systems, it appears MBL. And that's sort of the opposite of all these things. If we look at the eigen, we have do ed and look at the eigenstates, they have area law entanglement. Um, they don't obey ETH. Uh, the system isn't going close to thermal equilibrium. The level statistics have very weak level repulsion, much, much less than RMT. So it's sort of the opposite of all these things here. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm going to get to this. I'm going to get to this. If you guys let me. <laughs> Do you want to ask something? <laughs> well, okay, so one way to do ETH where you don't so one way to test ETH is to compare observables in one eigenstate with the next eigenstate up in energy, right? And that's a comparison. You don't have to know the Hamiltonian, you know, and it's fine if it's disordered, right? The expectation values of you know, the energy will be different on different bonds, but that's okay. We're just comparing. So ETH doesn't have a problem with disorder at all. Not a problem. Yeah. Did I say N? N? Where's N? Ah, yeah. Yeah, if I if I write some capital N's, they probably yeah. Okay. So But as I will say later, we have good arguments that this system here thermalizes in the system. I have to give it. I'll get to this. Yep. Okay, now this one will start getting heavily studied more than 15, 20 years ago. And for most of that time, so, so you look at it and you see, oh, it symbolizes here and it's in the up here, right? So the phase transition must be, right? And that's what everybody was looking at it, focusing on, oh, let's find a phase transition here and study it. And you know, we were all doing that. Um, and then more recently, you know, first of all, it wasn't working out very well. <laughs> and then a few skeptics were saying, oh, this, this doesn't really work. Maybe there really isn't a, a phase. But for, for me, there was this one paper, um, which, which the first author had. Like our, um, and they were looking in the MBL phase, and they saw some signs of more spin transport than you would think should be. And they were saying, you know, they, that was one of the papers that's. 
I was trying to think, oh, what the cause and what they're saying, right? And it, it made me think we need to study this regime more. So, so basically what happened is people were studying this, they were focused on this crossover and mostly you look in the MBL regime, it's frozen and most things you look at, it's just boring, it's happening. And so it didn't get a lot of attention. But I think now we know what to look for where there's actually happening. And that's what I want. That's another thing I want to put in. And so because of this work that suggested, oh, there's something interesting happening there. Uh, I knew David Luiz was interested in that also, and he does very good numerics. And so we started a project to, to study this in different ways than it's been studied. And I'm going to tell you about some of that stuff. Okay. So what I'm going to tell you about this paper for some of what it is. Our work is well able to prove one aspect of it. Fortunately, for the public, we're able to take advantage of his work. Mostly related work that helped us a lot. Um, and the one thing these papers did was. Oh, the idea that they see near this crossover down to way down here as a band. And this, when we got that result, I was strategic. I thought it might be down a factor of two. And more than I was. Upper bound at the AC now. And we did this based on uh, avalanche model. Certain we did a specific type of numerics which within a given model gives an estimate or an upper bound on where that is. That's the story I will tell you first. So the avalanche. Post on it um, is uh, so. This is something which was first well spelled out by the Ripple Supervisor. So now we're we're working with this this model. Well, it doesn't it? the avalanche argument's more general, but I do want to work with a model that has randomness. The, I'll do it in one dimension, but then I'll say some things about high dimension later. So here's 
optimal dimensional system. I'm looking at it a long way away, so I can't see the fins. And I'm looking at my length scale that's spacing between the fins. So this is just my one dimensional sample. And now it's infinite. And we look around in there, we find a place where just by chance, over some interval of length L, so this is length L, and I'm measuring the length in the number of spins. So that means L spins, L consecutive spins. And here, just by chance, these fields are all very close to each other. So it's effectively not very disordered, even though we're way down here, deep in the NBL region. So this is a locally thermalizing rare region. As long as this little L is finite, so the probability of this happening is exponentially small in this little L, right? But as long as this little L is finite, that probability isn't zero. It might be very small, but it's not zero. So if I have an infinite sample and I'm far enough, I'm going to find one of these. It's there. You know, it might be outside of the known universe, but it's there. Although I might not be able to look at it. Um, okay, and so what's happening here is whatever spin state this starts in, it will and it'll make a little local bath. And then the question is, does this bath everywhere else is typical? And so everywhere else, right, if I cut these two bonds here, everywhere else it'll be, it won't thermal. Just thermalize here, right? Cut those two bonds. But then when I restore these bonds, now the next spin here is coupled to a bath. And it'll get entangled with it and it'll thermalize and it'll join into the bath. And then the next spin, and then the next spin. Right, and so it's the question. So you've got this thermalization wave traveling out both ways, and as okay, so now let's go. It's gone distance r, and here's this spin, and, it, and there's a spin over here at distance r. And let's say the avalanche. When I say the avalanche has gone to distance r, what I mean it's thermalized all the spins out to distance R, right? And then the question is, can it thermalize the next spin? Okay, so, this, so now this spin at distance R uh, will relax at rate um, gamma of R, which, since it, it's got to couple through with all this localized stuff to the bath, the coupling is going to decay exponentially with the distance, right? At least naively. It's going to decay exponentially with the distance. And I like to call that decay k to the minus one. It's, it's kind of naive, but it's you know approximately correct. Okay. So this is going to relax at a rate ends with R and it's going to decay presumably exponentially or some function kind of like that. It actually kind of a little stretch um, when you actually do the numerics. I'll tell you how we did that. Um, and this guy also. Right. So first of all, if I cut this bond, this is local. Right? And so this spin coupled to all these other spins between here and the bath will not re relax this spin. So in order for this spin to relax, it's got to couple all the way back to one that's really in really the original. Okay? But the bath has recruited these other spins, and so it has a much higher density of state. So the bath has, has uh, 2 to the L plus 2R state, 
in it. All these are in pink. And so that means the level space. So that you do the two R because you don't have level space going as four minus over two. The delta is anybody but the space of my back. Just about that. And it grows. It recruits more. It then, as it grows, it gets better. As it, it becomes a better higher than higher than the extent. And that's the sense with sort of like an avalanche. The more it goes, you know, the more it tends to go. And then the question is, will it stop or will it come all the way in? Um, and but it's not like an avalanche because it's moving at a rate that's decaying exponentially with the distance. So avalanches don't move. Avalanches. This one is slowing down. Very slow. Okay, now initially this level four is minus an over two, and because that only one, this level spacing is small compared to this relaxation rate, and it doesn't exceed the thermal energy. Initially, at short distance, this is much smaller than this. Right? So, will relax at rate gamma and r is another plot here. Just from the informal argument that this is localized, right? This bit is only going to relax by coupling back to here. And this is all localized. So any influence of this out to here decays exponentially. It's got to be perturbative in our steps, right? Our step is perturbation theory to get this to come up with it. And so you just multiply all the small numbers, right? The idea that the parameter is J over W. Everyone is saying we have a weak coupling interaction and the big feet. J over W is something nice. That makes sense? So if I cut this bond, this spin will not relax, right? So this spin cannot relax due to coupling just to these spins here. Okay. So that tells you any process that relax this spin involves things to the left of this bond, right? And so whatever it is, is our order of perturbation. Yeah, the bath grows, but the system relaxes by these other things give the bath finals the states, right? But the, you can just see by cutting this bond that this then has to couple at least to here or further. 
in order to relax. Because we know if this bond is absent, it won't relax. It's all empty. Yeah, I, that's the way I argue. If you find it hard to believe, I'm comfortable. But I find it plausible. So what do you want to do? Just rubbing against my neck. I don't know. Okay. Um, say something. Yeah. Before we get to the question, let me just get to the point here. So this this is the relaxation rate. If we come to a continuum, that is the relaxation rate. If our continuum is discrete and the level space in continuum, it's not really a continuum, bigger than the relaxation rate, then it won't relax, right? You only get relaxation if the relaxation rate is bigger than the level spacing of the putative band. So the process will stop if this ever gets to be less than this, right? Now, if this is initial and K is less than four, it will just always be bigger than this, and the avalanche will never stop. So less than four avalanche does not stop. And K greater than four, it stops. Eventually, right? Eventually, this factor of K to the minus R is bigger than four. It's four to the minus, or, you know, it, it beats this, right? This is two exponentials, the faster one eventually becomes smaller. And so we have here, here, here we've got k bigger than four, here we've got k less than Well, as long as this is bigger than this, the next spin will thermalize on the time scale given by this. Oh, no, it's not optimized. It's just this, this time, right? So start and it's spreading, right? And as long as this is bigger than this, it keeps moving. It's a slower and slower rate. But if this drops below this, it's and then the rest of the system stays MBL. And the system doesn't thermal, it only thermalizes over some patch, which is right. Okay, so there were some hands up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we always mean by thermal. Well, it, it has to be thermal in that, you know, it, it isn't just in a thermal state. It's dynamically therm, you know, it, this, this patch here, I put it in a product state and it's thermalized itself. So it has to be self thermalized. It's dynamics. We're talking about dynamics. It's not a bath if it's not self thermalized. If you just take this model, that doesn't turn it into a bath. Being a bath and being thermal is a chemical question. It's not a question about the case. If spontaneously dynamic goes to a thermal state, even if you start it far from a thermal state. That's what I mean by thermal. Yeah, okay, so that's, okay, so so for the random problem, right, so this story of the avalanche, 
you can't get started. And I'm talking about, does it stop? And this is one way of the rate of we can make sure you, which I gave earlier, that if it's an infinite system, I understand the problem, it will get started, right? Now, if I had the quasi periodic problem, is there a way for it to get started? And that, an open question. You know, my feeling is there are other ways for explanations to get started that we don't know what they are. But I could be wrong. You know, I used to think, oh, quasi periodic, it won't avalanche because it won't get started. But I think that might have, but this is an open question. This is a very interesting open question. What happens with the quasi periodic case? It doesn't make the start of the avalanche and it also the avalanche is important. Or get started. That, that's that's an interest. Yeah. It's a hundred percent academic. Yeah. So that's one of the methods is this is an academic point. And we should focus over here, right? But I want to tell you why. Yeah. Is that this regime is not the MDL thing? It's, it's a pre-thermal regime. The word. It's called this. This is a pre-thermal regime. One thing, it's going to thermalize, and that's what we've learned. Right. And so really, I would like to tell you about this, but move on to this, which is the more interesting thing, because it's not an academic point. This is the physics that's accessible, right? But, thank you. Leo? Yeah. yeah. Well. It's interesting to look at the case. That's what I'm going to tell you. Um, so actually, what I'm going to do, if I have time, give you tell you what we got this down. Um, it's over here of what we think about the physics. It's over here, and then I go back to here and show the relation between those two. It is his paper, and if I don't get to it, you can go to his poster on Thursday night, right? No, we're comparing k to the minus r to four to the minus r. Right. This depends on r. See? Right, but whatever it is, if I go to large and r, this is on four. Right? Of exponentials, one of them is going to win. Right. Yeah, so this is so, so you know, Fermi's golden rule. Fermi's golden rule assumes a continuum. But now, say you have a state decaying into. Right. Instead of having a continuum, let's say we have a cavity, a level spacing, a level spacing, like cavity. and then you ask, when will this decay by Fermi's golden rule? And if you and if you we have this, I have a paper about this with again Allen and Alice Altland and Tobias Nicholas, author. Um, and, and this can actually be calculated exactly using the. Uh, and when the Fermi's golden rule rate is bigger than the level spacing, Fermi's golden rule applies and it does decay. But when the naive Fermi's golden rule rate gets smaller than the level spacing, it actually doesn't decay. And that's what I'm. Okay, so what do we need to do? We need to estimate K. 
or not it's not about whether it got started and so one thing we realize is since it doesn't depend on whether or not it gets started let's look at great big math here and see how it spreads right just you know, we're just trying to ask how how fast does this relax if there's a bath that starts this far away let's get that infinite it makes the calculation easier we can use open system and bloody type stuff right so the calculation we did is that paper is an open system calculation. We put it infinite in size, infinite in temperature. We weakly couple it. So this is weak. And the technical point that three cells helped us with was realizing we can take the asymptotic limit of extremely weak interaction here and spot for what we're trying to do it, was, it wasn't obvious to us but and then we put on a spin chain one a couple of the size one and then finally got here so this is a hamiltonian system weakly coupled here so this is weak compared to these guys and this is my bath. Now, infinite temperature. So, of course, this is going to thermalize to the identity matrix. The avalanche won't stop in this. But now, this infinity expression that was four to the infinity, and that's a that's an important number. That's always smaller than this. The avalanche won't stop, right? But we're trying to add that. We're just trying to add what's this, right? And and this is fine setup for doing that. And so for the Hamiltonian, we put a limp locking with the operators here. Uh, and do it numerically. What's okay? So, so the steady state will be the identity. So that's easy. We don't, we don't have to diagonalize it, but it's a steady state. We know it's the identity. Um, and then what's the slowest mode going to be? If this is an MDL, you know, deep in the MDL regime, the slowest mode is going to be flipping this spin. Right, and that's of course what you find. Although in a rare sample, sometimes the, the the slowest mode has more weight on the second to last spin than the last spin, just for peculiar reasons. But the, the slowest mode is very near the end, with most of its on average most of its weight on the last spin, but not necessarily not fully. On the last spin, right? But this is the so then you we're we're trying to get the slowest mode. Of a Limbladian, so it's like what Frank said. We can use Lanchos. We're, we're just trying to. We're not. We don't have to diagonalize the whole thing. We can use Lanchos and just get the gap. Um, and so we did that. Okay. And this right here is just the gap in that open system spectrum, right? Okay. And when we did that, and we. Also did the same thing. It's all qualitatively no differences other than in the extrapolations that he chose to make and we chose not to make. But you know, you can differ in extrapolations because there's no data there, right? And so that's we chose not to make any assumptions of how to extrapolate. The log of the decay rate. And now if there's a function of L, do the open chain and just have system like that and you get the slowest mode. Now if it was doing this, it would be a straight line, but you know, that would be too nice. Um, and so it curves. Not to be. So basically we have a the slope of this, say is K of L. Now it's decaying exponentially there with this depends on it. This is it is flowing. Curving this way. 
always curving this way. So therefore, the slope at the end here is an upper bound on k. So we get an upper bound. I guess we're doing one very weak extrapolation. It's saying it's always curving this way, and it's going to continue to always curve that way. Or it's never going to turn and curve the other, which I think is the pretty weakest thing. So, so by measuring the slope here again, you're getting an upper bound on k, and an upper bound on k, if it's less than four, it tells you you're not in the MBL phase. But if k is less than four, the avalanche does not stop. If I have an upper bound k that's less than four, then k is less than four. And so by getting this upper bound, you're the biggest L to do, we get which is a bad. The interesting thing about this, those of you who do uh, ED type, so this is, is normally you stop your numerics because the Hilbert space got too big, right? Whereas here, you know, since things are going down exponentially at four to the L, in fact, starting extra than four to the L, and uh, we didn't stop because the Hilbert space got too big. We stopped because the thing we were measuring disappeared into the round object at about 13 or 14 seconds. Um, the double precision. And then we switched to quadruple precision, but quadruple precision is a thousand times slower on the computer because the double precision is hard coded and the quadruple precision is, is software. And so we were able to use the quadruple precision to confirm that our double precision was okay, but we weren't able to go any farther, which was kind of frustrating. Um, okay, so 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 that's the story of the avalanche and where this bound is coming from. And then because of what I was just telling you, right, we hit double precision limit. You know, what's that? That's 10 to the minus 13. And so that means the relaxation time relevant to this is at least 10 to the 13 microscopic units. And that's why it's 100% academic. Yeah. Well, we have a, can you see this bath here? Right, okay. Oh, oh, right. Let, let, me, uh, let me just move it over. So. so we have a bath here. Arbitrarily weak coupling. So this is weak. That's what I wrote. Weak. Limit. And you can take the limit of arbitrarily weak coupling, and that's okay. I'm not going to go through that argument, but you can re that out and re it. it. Seems good. And here it is coupled to spin one. This is the farthest from the bath. It's the slowest. So relaxing spin L is naively the slowest part. If you know about MBL, you might know about L bits or local intervals of motion. We're teaching the MBL regime to a good approximation. These spins are the sort of quantities in the MBL system. And so the last L bit, oh, it's, it's not strictly the last L bit. We can sue about that. You know, there's, there's different things. But the slowest mode is here at the end. You know, this is the thing. You know, Go to Yun Su's poster and, and he'll tell you all about what goes on near the end here. <laughs> Spend a lot of time in that. Because we looked into this in a lot more detail. He's not on the original paper there, but we looked into a lot more detail since then. So, so we have we have this Lin Bladian, which is a super operator operating on this system here. By taking the weak coupling limit, we can look at only the eigenstates of this. We don't have to worry about any coherences inside of here. And so that reduces that problem from 4 to L by 4 to the L down to 2 to the L by 2 to the L, makes it tractable. That's the reason's contribution. It makes it more tractable. And so you have a, a matrix here, which is basically all the math does is it makes stochastic transitions between eigenstates of this. At some rates, satisfying 
your detail balance. Um, and then you just diagonalize that. It's a stochastic matrix. Or you don't diagonalize it. You find the slowest mode of it by lambda. And that's our estimate of gamma of f. Yeah. yeah, it's the gap for the limit of the slowest mode. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you start off in, it's in any state, and in the limit of long time, it'll be the identity plus a little bit of this other mode, which this has been polarized and has a decaying exponential. Everything else stays back. Okay. Right. And then, so, so, so that's where this came from. And as I said earlier, you know, when we started this calculation, I was thinking, oh, it might be a factor or two further down from this. And I was pretty surprised when the data came out and it was much further than I expected. And so this opens up this great big regime in the phase diagram. That's not the MPL phase, it's, it's the pre thermal MBL regime of the thermal phase, right? And, so we sh and we shouldn't think of this as a phase. Anushka was already making arguments that this was a crossover. So it's, it's, the idea that this was just a crossover wasn't a new idea. The thing that was new is that this is so far down. Yeah. Why is the number small? I might get to that. And again, if I don't, you can go to Gunn's Foos poster <laughs> and ask him. <laughs> he'll give you his. He'll give you his version of that. <laughs> but I hope to get to that maybe tomorrow, because because if I spend enough time, I'll go to Gunn's Foos poster. <laughs> okay. Okay. So so because of that, we sort of have this change in. What the MBL problem is. We used to think the MBL problem for this model was understanding this phase transition. And you know, we also have a renormalization group theory of this phase transition, which I don't want to tell you about because it's only of 100% academic interest. Um, and, uh, but now we realize this isn't the interesting part of it. Although, you know, of course, as theorists, you know, this is the only part that's sharply defined. And so we need to focus on it really should be a low priority. Now that we realize it on a time scale longer than we get to the universe that it's relevant. Um, and, and so we should focus over here. Okay, so, so that's what I want to do now. And, and really all I want to do is tell you what is something interesting going on in this regime that we found a new way of exploring. And that's if anybody resonates. Again, knew about many body resonances, but we found you know, a way of exploring the behavior down here in a way that was different. And that's also in this case. What are many body residents? Got a history, but papers are more long than Clark. People are looking for reference, and somehow I did. <laughs> it's one of the other ones I'm telling you, and I think it might only be on our it might not actually be public. And then there's uh, I also have a more recent paper with what David Long and Vedika Kamani, I think, which is related. I'm not going to mention that one. Um, very nice paper. Garrett, Roy Walker. One. 
some of the some of the paper recent papers focusing on on uh, many body resonance. Okay, so what's a many body resonance? And so now I'm gonna here's my sample again, and uh, I'm just gonna show the same sample again here, and then we're gonna have a state space A and B, which are sort of each of these are. So now we're in the NBL phase. This is a putatively localized. You see what I mean by putatively localized eigenstate. Not state of discussion. Uh, and, and so is this one. Uh, and then we have, if I compare these two states, there's some region here, like now. Where the uh, states differ. Okay, so we're talking about a model like that. We're deep in the, let's say we're pretty deep in the MBL regime. So these putatively localized states will have, they'll just be spins up and down in some random path. Localized states are roughly what I was telling you about for this. The first order, they're the eigenstates of this, and then you add. Situations, but it's a very long thing. But, all right, and so here they're the same. A and B are the same. And here, and then here, you know, on about a half of the spin, we have this region. You know, there's some spin here, which is oppositely oriented between A and B, and same here at this end. And then in between, there's like half of them reflecting half of them. And then if these two states are almost degenerate, there's a matrix element in the dynamic, say the Hamiltonian, that couples this to this. And so in this two state, in this two state, space, And if HAB, well, the real resonance, so, so we're, resonance is ultimately in near resonances. So we also care about near resonances, but for real resonances, you know, resonance is when HAB is of order greater than or of order the energy. And then the actual eigenstate is a significantly mixed between A and B because this matrix element from here to here uh, is enough to mix. Okay? Just elementary two level system stuff, but in a many body. I'll get to that. So this is this is this is just to describe, you know. So don't worry, just please, and then I'll tell you what we're gonna do is we're gonna get the eigenstate and then try to construct A and B. So we're gonna build these from the eigenstate. So so we're not gonna start with A and B and then find the eigenstates. We're gonna find the eigenstates, we're gonna get the eigenstates and data from the eigenstates to get A and B. But it's not obvious how to do that, and I'll tell you. Anybody else? Yeah. What did I say? Well, we, what 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 matters is comparing it to this energy difference, right? Right, and of course, this energy difference can be. Actually, so there's a point to make. So you might think, oh, this can be as small as two to the minus L. You might think that. But we have two to the L, this L. 
we have two to the L taken from there. And so we have four to the L pair H state. And then we have Poisson distributed. So the smallest HAA minus HAHBD is my like local overall state, plus so four to the minus. If we have no level. So if we have no level in you know, when you have Poisson level statistics, the many body spectrum has gaps all the way down to four to the minus L. Because it has the tip gap is two to the minus L, but you got to have two to the minus to get it smaller. And so, you know, when they say it's the Heisenberg time, it's two to the L. When you're talking about strong localized systems, there's interesting physics happening on longer times than that because there are gaps that are smaller. And, and those are the active modes. So these energy differences, you know, can be just be very. Of course, they get up to fairly close because you can see them over in the sample energy. Yeah, say we're. Let's say we're. So we're told you we said we hear these plants. Right? We've got a. I don't. I don't want to get too close to this. So, so this is all about pairwise resonances using pairs of states, and thermalization is infinite order resonances. And presumably, as you approach this crossover, your resonances, you know, start being involving three states, five states. You know, and initially we thought, oh, we can sort all that out, find three state resonances and stuff. And after a while, we realized you know, this isn't so simple. Let's focus on two state resonances, which is fine. Being here. In fact, one, another thing we did is we asked in this regime, where will a typical sample of length L have an end to end resonance typically amongst all those pairs of states? And it's only in part of this region. The resonances in typical samples go away long before you get to this phase. Okay. Yeah. Right, the typical sample in the NBL phase does it's, it's far away from having resonance. Although, if you look over many samples, you will find by end to end resonance. We have a sample of length L, we ask for a resonance to the whole sample, which is what we've studied. And those typical samples in the NBL phase have none of them, they only have short range. Okay. Eric, this paper is all about it short range resonances in infinite systems. I think you should go to Hume's poster. <laughs> there is a relation. It's very interesting, but it takes a long time to tell. And I'm going to do it tomorrow. Get up early enough to get a good night's sleep. Okay. Yeah, so naively, right. So naively, if we just take a typical state and one that's close by in energy, this is going to be, let's just call one of these, zero, just shift our energy, zero of energy to one of these. So typically, for a typical state, a typical sample, I'm just going to call this zero. So this is zero. This is two to the minus L if we just do typical. And then this is exponentially small in L because we've got the property flips, you know, all the way from here to here. So it's perturbatively L steps to get there. And so we're going to have some constant J over W. And we're going to get to the L. So that's this is the way things scale. And so you look at this, and uh, you know it immediately tells you, oh, the resonances are going to proliferate, and C J over W is about a half, and that's, crudely speaking, what's here. That's this cross. It's crudely speaking, really. If you read, if you interpret what Bosco and Elena Altshuler said, that's basically what they said. 
and and Anusha, Phil and Anusha said it very explicitly. These, these papers think very explicitly. But I'm not I'm not going there. I want to just tell you about this this regime and how we might see it and learn more about it. Because if you go here with proliferate, pairwise resonance is not the best the story. It's something more complicated. But hopefully that will get you. On that. Okay. Oh, yeah. More than one beam. To do that over here. So now I'm going to look at this. And we're going to do this in two D as an example. So now here's my rare region. Let's give it a radius L, and our avalanche now goes out like this, this was far, right? And now this is going as k to the minus L plus R. No, k to the minus R. This is still going as k to the minus R. I shouldn't have changed it, right? Because the spin over here has to just, you know, it has to it just can can couple to here just by a path, right? But the bath grows by the area, so this gets changed to. Let's not worry about the four, but basically up to. And there's an L plus R squared, right? I and stuff like that. I'm not worried about the order one thing, even up in the exponent. Um, so now this decays faster than this, no matter what, right? This is linear in R, this is exponential quadratic, right? And this decaying faster than this means the level spacing of the bath is always smaller than this. The avalanche will never stop. So that tells you, and this is in uh, the Rook and Huvenirs, uh, the avalanche happens at any J Avalanche won't stop at any non zero J in more than one dimension. So the NPL phase doesn't exist. JC, this JC goes to zero in this limit in two dimensions. And if you ask, what is the NPL phase transition in two dimensions? It's not that when the avalanche stops, it's when the avalanche starts. And so you have to do an analysis and ask. In a system of L by L, will there be a patch where the point can start? And Sarang Gopalith Krishnan and I did an analysis of that okay, with, of course, lots of assumptions. Um, and and uh, there is a phase transition if you take the large system limit in the appropriate way, where as you take L to infinity, you take J to zero in the right way. You can bring out a phase transition. It's not the thermodynamic limit, it's a different way of taking the limit, but there's a transition, which is whether or not the avalanche starts. So that's one comment about more than more than one B. And then the other comment is uh, this this uh, here it's in one D and involves L spin, but say I had two D, you know, and I had I had a Let's say we had some patch like this, inside of which the spins are flipped, and outside of which they aren't. And you know, this this L is really just a count of how many spins are inside the resonance, and it's not important whether it's one D or two D or three D, which is what Basto at all was thinking about. I think they were thinking about three D mostly. Um, and so this analysis isn't special to 1D, unlike the avalanche where 1D is very different than higher dimensions. Many body resonances, this aspect of them is not a big difference. The sense, you know, if you take what they said and put it in this language, it's essentially the same. Of course, they were, Presenting it in a totally different way on them. You know, they were at low temperatures, they were fermions. But if you just you know, translate with, you, you use what we know today and translate it, there's a lot of overlap between what they say and what I'm talking about right now. 
yeah, they concluded, they concluded, they concluded this, they concluded like we always did, this is the face mask. Right. Yeah. But but you know, everybody, everybody did that until just a few years ago. Well, they were estimating where this is, and they were saying this is the face, and this is, you know, of course they didn't know they didn't talk about thermalization at all. They were just focused on transport. Um, Up here, there's lots of them, and so that you know, we're, they were analyzing this in some sense the same way we were all analyzing it until very recently, thinking this is the phase, here's the phase transition, here's the thermal regime. They were producing and this is and what's the physics. You know, they didn't, they you know, they did some more formal perturbation theory, but it was essentially you know, some sense equivalent to what I'm saying. It's when these higher order processes happen, right? Do these things happen or don't you do the perturbation if it doesn't convert or not, right? And right, that's here, right? If this comes off faster than this, the perturbation theory is going to convert. <laughs> I think she's going to correct me. How many minutes do I have? Are you in charge? Three? Okay. Three. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me get started on yeah, just quickly what we did. Okay. So we didn't try to do this. We went with EP. We wanted to work with the Linux system. And so we asked for end to end risk. Look at the end to end risk. Basically, we cut our system off. It's a blank. That's the full system. And then we look at pairs of eigenstates. Now we're talking eigenstates, alpha, beta, different argument, where the first spin differs between alpha and beta and up or down, the last spin goes to. Now, if you just pick up pairs of adjacent and energy states, a quarter of those will be in the end resonance. When, it's a near, when I say a near resonance, I mean this is small, but this is small, so it's not really resonant, but it's almost resonant because the energy is equal. So, so end to end, so we have a system of length L, diagonalize it, uh, and we find pairs of states that are nearly generate, close in energy. Where they did for both in first and in last. And then we uh, look in this two state Hilbert space. So we have this two state space. And we look on the block sphere. So here's alpha, here's beta. And now we're just in this two state space. And if these guys are a resonance, I should be able to do a rotation to make to be mixed, right? If they were a resonance, A got mixed with B to make alpha, and it got mixed with B to make beta. But if so, if I just just want to go back and find A and B, which are the pair of orthonormal basis states that are most polar. So what we do is we just look for the A and B. Where the expectation values of the spin are the highest, right? When you mix these two states, the expectation value of the spins will go down because you're mixing something with spin up with something with spin down. 
Okay, so we just look at the expectation of some of the squares of the differences in the expectation values. Of we, yeah, we look at the sum of the, of the expectation values in all the, in the eigenstate, not in the eigenstate, in the A B state, and that over just this space. Okay, so it's not a big search space; it's just one block sphere. Easy to see. Uh, so we find the A and B, which we defined by the most localized pair of states on this block sphere made out of these two eigenstates. And then we look at the Hamiltonian in this basis. Of course, it's diagonal, but in this basis, it's not diagonal. And that's what we look at. So, so that makes these perfectly well defined. And this HAD is a matrix element of the Hamiltonian between two almost eigenstates. And if it's big, the actual eigenstates mix a lot. So that's, that's the procedure we use to study these records, gather a lot of statistics. It, it, it should be, but we found that that wasn't as, well, of course the entanglement is not as simple a thing to calculate as, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Actually, it's a good question, did we even, I'm not sure whether we tried that and found the other way worked better or whether we just did it the other way and it worked fine and we didn't even try that. We certainly talked about doing that. I'd have to ask Alan. Um, this, this was all Alan Morningstar's work. Um, you know, we certainly talked about doing that. I'm not sure whether we didn't do it just because it's not, because the other way is simpler and they're equivalent or that one actually doesn't, I, that I don't, that I don't. Excuse me. Well, it might be more that we did it this way and showed that the entanglement did go down, which is a different thing than using the entanglement to define A and B. But yeah, I don't. But that, you know, in principle, that should be a good way. But the thing is, if you don't just care about the entanglement at just one cut, so it's like, but that might make it better. Yeah, you'll average over many cuts. Okay, so so why don't we, since it's past the time, why don't we, so this is, I'm going to continue with this in the next lecture, so they've got me giving two lectures in a row, there's a 9 a.m. tomorrow. Yeah. Any questions? Expectation values. We're, we're deep in the MBL phase. So the expectation values of the spins in alpha and beta, they're close to fully polarized. There are occasionally you find ones which have small polarization. So there's a few spins. You know, so, you, so you have to pay attention to that. There will be a few cases where some of these polarizations are very small. And you got to be a little careful, but they're pretty rare because we're talking about pretty deep in the MBL. So pretty much all of these spins have polarization, it's easy to tell what sign it is. It's all up all down, but 10% you know, below or something like this. It's just because we're doing it in the that We push towards the transition, that gets less and less so, and then more states get involved in the resonances, and you know, we haven't really dealt with it. I think that's that's like a future thing to try to try to make practically do that. here yeah no no so you know the avalanche idea as you see 17 it's a long time ago and nobody has you know if you if you work well if you work even centric, searching around here looking you know you, you do samples right ED, length 20 or something, and you might get thousands of samples. And the avalanche would be rare sample. And or the thing that takes the avalanche would be the rare sample. Nobody. 
So they're rare. You know, when I say rare region, I know they're rare because they haven't found it. But I also know there's because the argument for there is clean. But it doesn't tell you, you know, whether they're one or ten to the nine spins or one to the ten to the nine spins. Or, you know, we know they're not one to ten to the three or four spins, but that's how much we get, right? Although whether we're looking in the right way. Yeah. Okay. This would be so this is this is not this is the estimate of the cross. Well this physics is the cross, right? It's when the the crossover is the resonance is becoming common. That you know, typical pair of states is in resonance with other things, right? And but we don't know what this C is, but yeah, we can we can get it from the ground. I haven't told you what it is. Well, that's an interesting question. Is does this right? I say K of L flow curves strongly. Does this flow? We look. If it flows, it flows weaker than that. And and we don't really, you know, that's one of the things I, I'm gonna get to is, you know, you know, this exponential behavior, this thing being exponential is clear in the stuff we've done, but whether there's a real curvature there or not. And if so, what is the mechanism? You know, I, I thought by now, you know, we 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 did a bunch of studies of this, but I was we were never able to get something where the data seemed well done in showing a systematic curvature. Whereas this thing over here, it curves, you know, you know, no matter what you do, the curvature's off this thing over here. So this is somehow either more weakly curved or we're not doing it quite right. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's other reasons for it to move. Right, there's prefactors. Right? You know, this is this is asymptotically at large L, but of course there's a prefactor here and a prefactor here, and they're different, right? And so if this is equal to, you know, that'll go. So so certainly there is a shift here, which is just due to the prefactor. Phil and Anusha emphasize that, and that's clear. So so you know, so it definitely shifts, but is it all just due to the prefactors, or is it due to actually curving the exponential and flowing? Does that, does that sound fine on this the way I said that? No, no, let's let's talk about the resonance. No answer. Just just look at the resonance. You know, you, you emphasize that this and this have very different prefects, right? Yeah, you one over lambda, I forget what you call it. Right. And that's a lot of what causes this to flow. Right, at least in my understanding. Yeah. In a in a you know in yeah it's, it's, so the pre thermal MBL regime is sizes below you know, small enough sizes so it's looking to be a What, what different base? Oh, I'm just using the word pre-thermal because you know we have something, there's some phenomenon that's occurring over some big dynamic, and then we believe it thermalizes at much larger scale. And the word pre-thermal seems to be being used for that. And so we're just adopting it here. So this is this is just, you know, it's just a name. What I mean is there's a regime of behavior. We don't believe it's asymptotic and asymptotically it will thermal. And I think usually when people say a pre-thermal something, that's what they mean. But, but that's what I, and I'm not saying it's like other pre-thermal things.
yeah, I guess if you had an alcohol all model and you were working in, yeah, no, you have phenomena like this in Fox space localization, right? Is it something with, I'm sorry, yeah, stuff like this happens in random graphs, I think. Sorry? Yeah, but that's, It's true, the pre-thermalization in flow K involves resonance, resonance in large scale. That's, that, that's something I was thinking of talking about, but clearly I'm not gonna get to it tomorrow. Yeah. I haven't thought about it. Infinite. Doesn't thermalize. It doesn't thermalize. Right. Because the system's finite size, it doesn't thermalize. Right. The eigenstates aren't thermal. So if the eigenstates aren't thermal, that means it doesn't thermalize. In order to thermalize, you have to make the system a lot bigger. Yeah, but people can come up, we can continue. Did you have a question? <laughs> okay. 